Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Doug Evans, Chair of the Department of Surgery at the Medical College of Wisconsin, and welcome to our weekly session on programs and innovations in the Department of Surgery. Today, I'm lucky enough to be with Amanda Kong from our, department, from our Division of Surgical Oncology. Amanda is a graduate of Brown University, where she also stayed for medical school. She did her surgical training at Mount Sinai in New York and her fellowship in surgical oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. In fact, I was on faculty at Anderson when Amanda was a breast surgical oncology fellow, and we first got to meet at that time. She was recruited here to the Medical College of Wisconsin in 2008, and also obtained, in her first couple of years here, obtained a master's degree in public health. Today's topic is breast cancer, and Amanda, maybe for our first question, we can talk a little bit about the surgical options that are available for a woman newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Of course. Uh, well, there's main, two main options. One is breast conserving surgery, um, and the other is a mastectomy. Those have been around for many, many years. We have over, well over 20 years worth of data that shows that breast conserving surgery um, with radiation is equivalent in terms of survival and essentially local recurrence with a mastectomy. So women often ask me, well, how do I make that choice? And I say, well, it's one of two different things. One, how big is the tumor relative to the size of your breast? If it's too big, sometimes we can't do a lumpectomy, although sometimes we can also shrink it with chemotherapy if they really want a lumpectomy. And for some women, that's important. They want to save their breast, um, the feel and the look. For other women, uh, they have to have a mastectomy or it's a personal choice. Um, in terms of reconstruction, we've come very, very far. So it used to be that you could only get a basic implant, but now we can use um, parts of your own body, what we call autologous reconstruction. So this is if the whole breast is removed. Right, correct? so mastectomy is removal of the entire breast. And so we can actually recreate the breast, not just with an implant, but we can use um, the tissue from your belly, essentially the same operation you would get as if you had a tummy tuck. Um, we can use um, the muscle from your back. We can use um, the fat from your thigh. We can actually do quite a bit. So women have a lot of options these days. And in terms of saving the breast, we actually have something called oncoplastic breast surgery where we can do a lumpectomy and we work in conjunction with a plastic surgeon to recreate the breast with your own tissue. Your breast does become smaller, but we can give you a lift or a reduction um, and achieve the same goals. So it really is, um, certainly for, for a woman who's newly diagnosed and the, and the, the shock of having cancer, how do, how do you introduce, it, it just seems like it must easily be information overload with the, the issue of chemotherapy, which you mentioned is oftentimes given prior to surgery, um, uh, the decision making involved in whether to do a lumpectomy, part of the breast removed, or take off the whole breast, and then introducing the whole aspect of cosmesis. So maybe two, um, two related questions. Number one, um, what do you do when, when the patient says, well, Dr. Kong, what would you do? Uh, because they, they op I imagine they would value your opinion um, incredibly. And then secondly, what do you do with the patient who is so shocked about the cancer diagnosis that, um, that you're afraid that a year, two years from now, she'll have a, a poor cosmetic result just because of wanting to get rid of the cancer quickly. And how do you bring that person back down to earth? So maybe address those two areas. Okay, so um, the first thing that, I get that question all the time, what would you do? Um, and my standard answer is, you know, I, I'm here to give you all the information. I'm not, I don't live in your shoes. I'm not gonna wake up in your body tomorrow morning, but I will help you make that decision. So we sit down, I usually write down what their disease process is. We talk about, hey, this is the size of your, your tumor. It's the size of a grape, it's the size of this. And look at the size of your breast. Can you imagine this would leave a divot or this wouldn't? So I can, I'm honest with them. If you want a lumpectomy or removal of just the tumor and a little bit of tissue around it, I'll tell them, I'll be honest, like this is gonna look good or this is not gonna look good. And usually people knowing that the survival is equal with each procedure, um, they just wanna know, is it gonna look good or not, whether I have a lumpectomy or not, that helps make the decision. If I say it's not gonna look good, then they say I want a mastectomy. 
Um, or if it's someone who's older with a lot of medical problems, I may say, well, this operation is too big for you, let's do this one. I would say the average woman who's healthy, maybe in her 50s or 60s, um, we just have a long discussion about personal preference. And some people just have a lot of anxiety and they say, I just really want a mastectomy. So I would say the vast majority of people actually have a strong, strong opinion when they're coming into sure. the office. When people come to the office and they're overwhelmed with their decision or they're undecided, there's two things I do. One, I say, look, this did not, this tumor did not grow overnight. There are no emergencies in breast. Very rare. I mean, if someone has something called inflammatory breast cancer, that's a different story, but that's again a very rare diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So if someone can't make the decision, I usually say, well, let's send you to a radiation oncologist and a plastic surgeon so you can hear both sides of the story and make a good educated decision for yourself. And I tell them, this is this is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and it's important to get everything done right and go to the operating room once so we're not looking back in a few years and regretting decisions. And when I show them their survival, um, usually we talk about how big their tumor is and what, what entails in determining their stage that gives them their survival. When I tell them, for example, if someone has stage one disease and they're super anxious, I say, you know, your five-year survival is 90 to 95%, it's excellent. You know, and with all the new things we're coming out in terms of medical therapy, you know, survival's even improving. So usually people are okay with that and um, prepared to make a decision. Yeah, you know, I was, I, I, I do have a couple more questions. We could go on for forever on this topic, but how does a woman, um, say a woman gets out of the shower this morning and feels a lump, um, where do they go? How, how do they start the process? I have a lump in my breast, and who should I see? Should, should I call um, your office? Should I call the breast center at, uh, at the MCW Freighter Cancer Center? I mean, what is, should, do I call my family doctor? What, what is the way that you at least start the process? I would say there's two ways we usually see patients. One is some people have a very close relationship with their primary care doctor. So oftentimes uh, we will receive a referral through the primary care doctor. They'll call them, they'll go in the office, they'll go for an exam. The primary care doctor will start the work up with a mammogram. And at least um, in our breast center, when the diagnosis is made, they'll let the primary care doctor know who will automatically put them in the, the system to see one of the breast surgeons. The other way we see patients is some patients are self-referred um, self and they will call our breast center. Um, and when that happens, they'll often see one of our nurse practitioners first um, and they will start their workup with the mammogram. But sure. I would say most people usually see their, their GP first. Yeah. You know, when I was um, in training, which um, sadly was in the late 1980s, uh, breast surgery was actually evolving as its own specialty. In fact, the, where I did my surgical residency, my department chair was, uh, his practice was devoted solely to breast surgery. And he, I think his generation was probably the first to subspecialize just in breast surgery. And then of course, when I, when I did my uh, fellowship, the, the same as you in, in Houston at Anderson, um, we had a whole section of breast surgery. And, I, and at least my perception as a pancreas and endocrine surgeon who no longer does breast surgery but as a surgical oncologist was that it really evolved as a subspecialty because it was perhaps the first solid tumor where everyone realized the complexity of interdigitating chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation. It really it was the, the paradigm for the complexity of that and for many general surgeons knowing when to start with chemotherapy um, not to mention what operation may be best, mm -hmm. how to interact routinely with plastic surgery and radiation oncologists. It just became impossible. If you were also right. doing hernia surgery, gallbladder surgery, even colon cancer, et cetera, mm -hmm. maybe you can talk a little bit about where, the, I mean, right now the field has just gone light years to where it was when, when I trained in the late 80s and 90s as to the, the complexity of the disease and the importance of seeing people like yourself who, who think about breast cancer uh, seven days a week. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that breast has been the model for multidisciplinary care, um, cancer care across you know all disease sites. Um, I think there's a notion that breast surgery is, um, is simple and therefore not complex, but really those of us who do it all the time realize it's not the surgery, but it's every aspect coming together to form the idealized individual plan for each patient that makes their survival 
um, the best it could be and gives them the ultimate cosmesis and everything all in one that we can give for each patient. So for example, there are times when, um, you know, I'll call my medical oncologist and say, hey, you know, um, she has a HER2 positive tumor. She needs this drug beforehand. They'll say, I agree, you know, we'll meet at our tumor board. So we actually have all these individuals who meet together every week and we discuss each patient individually. Um, and so the patient actually gets the benefit of the entire campus. Correct. Um, not just the, the individual surgeon that they may have seen or an individual Correct. Um, medical or radiation oncologist. And it's important because um, say a woman has a large tumor and they're going to have a mastectomy anyway, but they may need radiation. Well, they want reconstruction. The plastic surgeon needs to know they're going to get radiation because that's going to affect what kind of reconstruction that the plastic surgeon will offer to the patient. So it's we can't make decisions um, in silos. We have to make them together as a group uh, or that patient will just have disjointed care. And it's, it's nice because we're all in one center. So we're able to talk to each other and communicate constantly. Um, and that that's what goes on behind the scenes that patients actually don't see, but we all sit together. And so even outside of the tumor board, we're constantly communicating sure. with each other. Well, I think many of you who are watching this, this short video have, have uh, either seen Dr. Kong as a patient or you have a family member. She's now been here so long that she has a huge practice in southeastern Wisconsin. Maybe I can finish with one, uh, with one uh, topic or one question that is a little bit removed from, uh, from the breast cancer field, but I think is, is something that you are uniquely qualified to answer, and I think many people would, li would like to know your thoughts. And, and one area that you've been incredibly successful at is not only in work as, a, as an academic surgeon, as a talented surgical oncologist, but also as a wife and a mom. And how do you juggle home, work, um, making sure your two little girls and your husband, I can probably include him in, in the group of three <laughs> children, how do you get everything done in a week and you know, do you have kind of a couple little uh, helpful tips? Um, well, I'll say this. Um, I have a nanny and she's amazing and she does, um, she helps me out a lot, but you know, um, I'm, I have to be very organized and I have to, I have my time set aside for my job and while I'm here, I am 100% here um, and I'm 100% for my patients, but when I'm home, I have to be there for my kids. They're really the most important thing to me. But my patients know, I'll tell them, you may get a phone call with your pathology at nine o'clock at night because that's when the kids go to sleep. Um, and I know that it's important because those people are waiting for those answers. Um, and my husband is incredibly supportive of my job and very proud of what I do. But, you know, I, I realize that my job is important, but my family's equally important. So I think he knows I'll, I also don't require as much sleep as him. So I'll be up, you know, pre prepping for tomorrow's dinner and finishing my clinic notes. Um, but I love both things and I would never give either of them up, so. Well, for those of you who have uh, walked the halls of Freighter Hospital on a Saturday morning, you oftentimes have seen Dr. Kong with uh, one or two of her daughters uh, in tow. So Amanda, thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.